Victory in Jesus. I'm going to surprise everybody, and I'm actually going to start off with our text for the message, because if I don't, I'll wind up getting going and never come back to it. 1 John verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John 5, 4. Bible says, for whatsoever, whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. Now this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. As I was thinking about this this morning, I want to preface by telling you something. And those of you listening online or on the radio, please listen very carefully to this, what I'm going to tell you. I have the authority of the Word of God and the authority of my testimony. I can tell you things. But I cannot do what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the righteous, the Son of the living God, one he is still alive today, and he's sitting on a very real throne with his feet on something very solid, far more real than what we can sense with our five senses. He's alive. And now here's the most important thing I want you to know. Whether you're saved or not, whatever your situation is, listen to me, he has the power and the authority to change your life today. To change you today. We live in a society and a world that says you can't change somebody. You might as well take them the way they are because you can't change them. Well, you might not can. Now, a frying pan in Sally's hand to get a long way to change me a little bit. <laughs> but God changed me. And I know some of you here who are changed. And when the Bible talks about the word change, it doesn't mean like changing something that's dirty into something that's clean so much. It means like making something completely new. Change. Absolute change. Listen. Hear this because this will draw you into the rest of the word. God can change you. We're a people that are broken and bent on saying change my situation when that's not really the problem. We always want God to change my situation, change my husband, change my spouse, change my boss, change the nation. Lord, change me. Change me. Fix me. He will do that. Go to Isaiah chapter 53, and I want you to hear the word of the living God. And as you go to Isaiah 53, I want to tell you a little something about this that just, this fascinates me. Throughout the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is one of the great prophets of all time. And Isaiah is the one that said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child. Uh, Isaiah is the one that, that talked about, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Isaiah in detail, in great detail, he went through and he, he spoke of a coming Messiah. He spoke about Jesus coming, being born of a virgin. Now here's an interesting thing. How many of you, you know, let me see, how many of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, just about everybody. The Dead Sea Scrolls are these actual documents. I mean, you can look this up on Google, go to the most unreligious websites you can find, and you can still read about the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is history that the world accepts, okay? This is um, um, some of the finest archaeological finds that have ever been found. Um, they found these scrolls that are what our Bible actually was translated from. There's a whole story behind them, how these, uh, these people had seen that they were being invaded, the, the children of God, they were being invaded, they had the scriptures, and they wanted to save them, so they start rolling them up and putting them in jars and hiding them in caves and because they were going to be destroyed and they knew they were going to be killed, but they wanted the Word of God to live. Think of that. They knew they were going to die, 
They knew they were going to be slaughtered in battle, but they wanted to preserve the word of God, and they did, hallelujah. They did. God has seen to that since the beginning. And yet we've got these laying all over the house, and sometimes we don't ever read them. If you only, if you only let the Holy Spirit come alive in you and start reading the word of God to you, you will never be the same. But anyway, when they find all these scrolls, as they find them, they start going, to, you can watch a documentary on this sometime. It's, it's, really, it's really something else. They're, they're putting all these pieces together, hundreds of years old. They have established, for the best part, it's in agreement that they were at least 100 B.C. in the age of them. 100 years before baby Jesus was born. Now, it's parts and pieces of a lot of different books of the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament wasn't written yet. But here's an interesting thing. There's one book that they found the whole thing. They found enough parts to put together, and they reassembled the whole thing. And it was the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah with 66 chapters, just like the Bible has 66 books. It has an Old Testament and a New Testament. Isaiah is split up almost the same way. And a, a document, now picture this and then we'll get into this read. A document they found that scientists agree is at least 100 years older than the story of Christ. And yet it predicted with great accuracy the coming of Christ. Wow. That's pretty awesome. That gives a credibility to the mind for whatever that's worth. But what I want you to, and I say that because... The Spirit. May the Word of God touch somebody's heart today. Because what I said a few minutes ago, the Spirit of the living Christ has the power and the authority this morning to change your life. I, and a quick testimony, 35 years of alcohol. I handled it real well, but I was a drunk. I mean, you can dress a drunk up or you get, Otis was a drunk, but so was Darren on Bewitched. You know, he was a high-powered executive. I was a drunk. I had a perverted mind, like most, like the vast majority of men in this nation. I was hooked on pornography. Selfish ambition. We had made a lot of money. We sold a company to Dick Clark. We had notoriety, and I wanted more. I wanted more. Boy, that's a bite that gets you. God took all of that away from me and saved me. He saved me. And I'm here to tell you, he will save anybody listening to me right now. He'll change your life if you'll only learn to put your faith in him and let him change you. He prescribes a way to do that. And it's nothing I can do. I can't put my hand on your forehead and make you fall over backwards. I can't do some special thing. But God can mysteriously, mystically change you. And you can literally be born again. Chapter 53, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. That's what Jesus is. That's how he came. He's a tender plant. You remember we talk about how this is so amazing. Baby Jesus is born the son of almighty God. The creator. And here's this little bitty frail fragile baby. That God didn't even really protect in his own way. He played by the world's rules. Here comes Herod killing every baby to try to destroy this child. Would have done it. But God had chosen a couple of children that would obey him. Joseph and Mary. And he sent a dream and says, get up, take the baby to Egypt quick. And they did. Otherwise, Jesus would have been killed. He was a tender shoot. Could have been destroyed. But God was playing it by these rules so he could buy us back by the same rules we broke and fell. And it says he came up out of dry ground. Boy, howdy. Could it be any drier than it is today? But this Jesus came up. And look at this. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Isn't that something? You're reading the book of Isaiah here. 
the actual prophecies of Jesus Christ. And somehow or another, we think of Jesus and we see this picture of him with long, beautiful, flowing Pantene hair and, and a white and blue eyes. That's not what Jesus looked like. If anything, he looked like a rough Middle Easterner. And he was not a good-looking man. I'm sorry to dash your hopes. It wasn't about his flesh. He had no beauty in him that we should desire him. He wasn't one that everybody says, I'd just like to hang out with him. He, he's he good-looking. He's friendly. he got a pretty voice. That's not what he was. Keep reading. He is despised and rejected of men. There's a word that if I used in the pulpit, Sally would be mad at me, that, that describes what some of the Pharisees and Sadducees called Jesus to his face. They called him an illegitimate child. A fatherless son. They called him that. He was despised and rejected. Because they knew that his mama got pregnant before she was married. And they wouldn't hear the word of God that Isaiah had said at least a hundred years before they saw this happen. They wouldn't hear it. He was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows. He was mocked. Listen, today, kids shack up and have babies and don't get married and nobody thinks anything about it. Now, even in my day, they did. There's a situation right here in Hell Center when I was very little. A couple were living together and the mayor went to their house and said, you're going to have to either get married or get out of town. We wouldn't even be Hell Center today if they tried that. They'd see the name off the place. Amen. It's a different day. But in Jesus' day, they wouldn't have said, you've got to get married to get out of town. They would have stoned them in many situations. Jesus' mother and daddy, could have, she, Mary could have been stoned. If Joseph hadn't gone on and said, I'll take her, I'll marry her anyway, and, and let people assume that he had been with her before they married, and all such a things. Jesus was a man of sorrow. Golly, think about it. He wasn't a privileged child. He lived this kind of a life. Listen, so you could relate to him and not just the high and mighties. He's the common denominator of man. He was acquainted with grief. And look what it says. This is still going on today. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. How many times somebody wants to talk to you about Jesus and you just kind of, mm, not right here, not right now. Still happening. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. We thought God was punishing him for some reason. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Now I want to tell you something about that. There's so many different doctrines and beliefs and religions, and even inside Christianity, and all that's made to divide man. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God heals people still today. I believe there are people prophesying. I believe there are real tongues that people speak in. I believe all that. I haven't seen a whole bunch of it, but that doesn't mean, <laughs> that doesn't mean the word of God is not still true. But when it says here, and many people use this for divine healings that a lot of times they don't see or produce, but he says, with his stripes we are healed. That can, I suppose, uh, if, it's, if it's used in, in God's obedience, that can be used for your healing in your body. But I want to tell you something. I have a list of infirmities that gets longer about every day as I get older. And we'll take some of Brother Mike's advice maybe on some of those, get them better. But I have plenty of infirmities that need healing. But I want you to know something. When you're looking at me, you're looking at a man that's been healed. By his stripes, I am healed. I'm a healed man. My heart's healed. My mind's healed. I'm clean inside. And I know the destiny of this thing I'm living in. I'm not worried about that anymore. I'm healed. I'm healed. And even though my finances are very limited, I'm a rich man. Amen. I share that a lot of times at the jail. I'll tell them about how we sold our company to Dick Clark. and We sold it for a million dollars. We made all this money on a contract for so many years. 
But we went through it all. So don't ask me for $20 today because you'll embarrass us both. <laughs> but then I like to tell them I'm as rich a man as you'll ever find. I'm a rich man and I'm happy. I got joy in my heart. And when I'm crying over something that's so sad, you still can't touch the joy that's in there. Because you know what? Joy and peace are kind of like this. The word I like to use to describe what I have in my heart, it's a sense of, listen to this, I love to say it. It's a sense of well-being. Well-being. It is well, it is well with my soul. It's where, where he says, whatever, whatever my lot. Thou hast taught me to say it's well with my soul. That comes only here because he, his stripes bring you the healing. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned away everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. Oh, dear sinner, hear this. Whoever may be listening this morning and you know, and for some of you who may not be sure where you stand with Christ, but some of you know, I've never really been out for that much for that religion. I've heard about it, but I've seen too much. I don't believe in it. Listen to me. Listen to me because there's only so much time. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, it's appointed and demand once to die, and then the judgment you're not getting out of this. Told all the guys at the jail last Thursday, this had never hit me. It was just on the way over there. I said, you've never been to trial. This is, all, this is all preparing you. Some of you who are listening right now in the county jail or in the state prison at Farm Bend Wheeler, I want you to hear something. In some ways, you're blessed. You've seen a judge in a robe stand in front of you and proclaim things and yet, if you straighten up and live your life right from here on out, you can make that right and you can clear it up. There's a judgment coming and there is a trial we're all going to face, whether you've ever seen the little ones or not. Those of you who've looked in a judge and you've heard guilty and you've had to bear the weight of your burden, you're blessed. Blessed are you because you can see and you can turn yourself now and save yourself from hell that's waiting. There is a trial coming. And if you're hearing my voice today and your ears still have blood running through them, you haven't been to trial. Because there is a trial coming. But Jesus, Jesus the righteous, took your guilt. And when you stand before that judge, listen, you're going to have nothing to say. You can say, but my parents... But my job, but every opportunity, all of this is going to do you no good at all. Amen. You can have the best story in the world, but it's not going to do you any good. You need an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous. There's one. And when he went through all of these things, when he was bruised for your iniquities, when he took all of this on him, it says, it says in there, oh, look at verse 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Imagine, imagine he's standing before the judge for what you did, and you know it. Some of you right now, think of that biggest guilt that rides you and it carries you everywhere you go. Every day you live with this guilt for what you've done. Amen. Jesus stood before the judge and when he was questioned, he's taking your blame. He's taking your blame and they're beating him. And they say, what do you have to say for yourself? He said, nothing. Not a word. Instead, he was taken right out in front of everybody with my guilt on his shoulders and hung on a cross and he died. Wow. John chapter 3, as we come to a close. Chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Listen to me. Listen to this. If you hear nothing else today, you are not going to see the kingdom of God, which is a deductive reasoning. You will see the depths of hell. You're not going to escape hell. You're not going to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Amen. There's no two ways about it. And here's the beauty of it. It's not rocket science. Remember how we described Jesus coming? He came as the lowest form. So that the lowest form of us can say, please help me. And know that we relate to him. He says, you've got to be born again or you can't see the kingdom of God. You come to Jesus Christ today. You come to him with all of your baggage. You don't try to clean up. You come with the drug still on the coffee table. With the bottle still on the counter. You come with somebody still in there in the bedroom asleep. Shouldn't be there. You come to him as you are. And you repent. And you say, I need you, Lord. I need you. Listen, the thing that's so forgotten anymore, people come and they're told different things and they come and they, they do what they feel like they're supposed to do and they leave and nothing has happened. We used an example the other day, ladies, if you were wearing a beautiful white dress and it just meant the world to you. It was an heirloom. It was your great-grandmother's and it fits you perfect and it's beautiful and it still looks new and you accidentally spill grape juice on it and it's all over the front and it ruins it. And somebody says, I can get that out. And they touch it. And it's perfectly white again. Are you going to go grab some pizza and start eating again? Or are you going to get something? That's how we live. Amen. When you get cleansed, when the heart is clean, when you truly are touched by the hand of God and your sins forgiven, you never want to sin again. That's another way you can know if you're actually saved. If you've ever been forgiven, if you've been forgiven of your sin, you don't want to sin anymore. Amen. Sad thing is you will. You'll slip, you'll make mistakes, but you won't walk right back into sin because it costs too much, and you realize that it did. Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he's old? Does he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot get into the kingdom of God because that that is born of flesh is flesh, and that that is born of the Spirit is spirit. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, Paul said, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can't take this in there. This is not, so that, listen, so that means nothing you can do with this thing. I can do this, and I, I can, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if I give my body to be burned and don't have love, it's wasted. Amen. This thing will not get in. So it has to be on the inside. So you can't come and do enough and say enough to get saved. You come this morning and you believe. Now you go down one more, one more place here in John chapter 3. Look at verse 14. It says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now here's what I want you to hear. We'll close. In Numbers chapter 21. You don't have to go there, but you can write it down. There's a story about the children of Israel being bitten by snakes because of their rebellion. God sent snakes because they were so rebellious and ornery. And they'd get bitten and die. And they're just getting bitten and dying and dying and dying all over. And finally they freak out and they go to Moses. They say, Moses, you've got to talk to this God. But we're all dying by these snake bites. So Moses goes and God says, fashion a snake out of bronze. Put it up on a pole. Listen carefully because I'm winding up. This is it. He says, put this bronze snake up on a pole and you tell the children of Israel, if any of them get bitten, look at that snake and believe and I will heal them. And Jesus said, I must be lifted up even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Jesus is lifted up today. He's on the cross and what I want you to hear, what I want you to hear right now, I can't do this. You can't do this. But if you will look to him on the cross right now and ask him, save me. 
forgive me of my sin. Right now, God will put a new spirit in you.